Okay, look, all I'm saying is that if the rogue is the one who picks the lock on the treasure chest, then they should get to decide how to distribute what's inside to the rest of the party. For the good of all. Call it the gospel of stealth. Here in Houston, Texas, in a stadium that used to be home to the Houston Rockets, resides Lakewood Church, the largest church in the United States. Its 16,000-seat house of worship was purchased from the city of Houston for $11.8 million and renovated into its current form for $100 million more. A leaked financial statement shows that the church probably recouped that money without too much trouble. They brought in $89 million in 2017, primarily from member donations, and used it to buy financial investments, property, advertising, artwork, all sorts of stuff. I would tell you what they pulled in last year, but as a church, Lakewood is automatically registered as a 501c3 nonprofit without needing to file any additional documentation about where they're getting their money or how they're spending it. It also means that Lakewood owes zero taxes on that income, that unlike other companies which have to pay the county, state, and federal government for all the public services necessary to keep a thriving media business operating, Lakewood's donation collecting operation is subsidized by American taxpayers. A football stadium, private jets, and a few million in financial investments is probably not what you'd think of when you hear the word charity. But religious 501c3s receive more charitable donations than any other category in the U.S. According to Giving USA, $146 billion in 2023, more than one and a half times the amount that went to the next highest category. This isn't just frustrating as a token, fedora-owning internet atheist who believes tax money shouldn't go to buying some celebrity a Lamborghini or $5,000 Yeezy sneakers just because they claim to be affiliated with Jesus Christ, but also as a humanitarian who sees a desperate need in all sorts of areas that aren't tax-free mansions for religious leaders. There are real pressing problems that that money could help solve, and, in my opinion, the lack of Yeezys on priests isn't among them. Of course, religious institutions are far from the only ones burning charity money on things that don't seem to make the world a better or more just place. There are more than one and a half million nonprofits in the U.S., and wouldn't you know it, some of them really suck. The Kids Wish Network, formerly the Fulfill a Wish Foundation, which was easily confused with the Make-A-Wish Foundation before they sued over the name, took in about $11 million last year, ostensibly to perform acts of kindness for children with terminal diseases. According to their financial records, two-thirds of that money went to fundraising, that is, paying for-profit marketing firms, and hiring consultants, such as the Charity Founders Consulting Company. It seems unlikely that when someone donates a dollar to Kids Wish, they'd be happy to know 66 cents is transferred to a telemarketing company's bank account instead of being used to grant dying children's wishes. This raises an interesting question. What would be the best use of the half a trillion dollars donated to nonprofits annually. If I wanted to make sure my charity money was going to a good cause, where should I direct it? You may have heard of Effective Altruism, or EA, a philosophical movement slash subculture dedicated to the notion that charitable donations ought to reap the greatest possible benefit per dollar spent. Last year, EA-affiliated organizations like GiveWell directed hundreds of millions of dollars to causes like preventing people from dying of malaria and vitamin deficiencies, supplying clean, drinkable water, vaccinating children, improving animal welfare, planting trees, all sorts of great projects that they painstakingly vetted and analyzed to ensure maximal philanthropic impact. Unfortunately, Effective Altruism's most headline-grabbing moment of 2023 wasn't about all the excellent humanitarian work they achieved. Last November, Sam Bankman-Fried, the CEO of his Silicon Valley cryptocurrency exchange, was convicted on numerous charges of fraud and conspiracy for his role in illegally funneling billions of dollars to a crypto investment company. Sam was a vocal advocate for effective altruism, claiming that his overzealous pursuit of ever greater sums of money was at least partially motivated by EA's earn to give doctrine, which encourages selfless, caring people who really want to do good for the world to do whatever they can to get filthy rich. The idea is that someone was going to make all that money, and it would be better if that someone was the sort of person who'd donate a significant percentage of it to something noble when they die, rather than blowing it all on cocaine and super yacht parties. It's a peculiar notion, certainly not totally bananas, but many find the argument unconvincing, perhaps more so after the SBF fiasco. It's impossible to know how much of Sam's decision to defraud his customers out of $11 billion 
was driven by the well-intentioned earn-to-give precept, as opposed to plain old-fashioned greed. But the whole mess prompted a round of journalistic investigations into some of the other weird ideas that flourish under the EA umbrella. For example, long-termists believe that the total human population will continue expanding rapidly, vastly exceeding the number of humans alive today, and that this implies we ought to dedicate a proportional amount of today's resources to ensuring their happiness. That sounds plausible, but the prescriptions long-termists build on those assumptions are unintuitive. Because they place such enormous moral weight on these numerous imagined future people, many otherwise important present-day causes get put on the back burner. Climate apocalypse, nuclear war, genocides, let alone rounding errors like social or economic injustice, are all small potatoes compared to the moral imperative of ensuring a future with lots more people in it. This Rube Goldberg machine of teetering assumptions compels long-termists to throw large sums of money at things that most people don't find morally compelling, like AI research or outer space governance, on the outside chance that rogue AIs or space habitats might impact the long-term survival of the species. Again, you can kind of see how they get from here to there if you squint. But a position like, the most moral thing you can do with your charity money isn't feeding the hungry, caring for the sick, or rendering aid to the poor, it's funding speculative research about AI safety and colonizing Mars. That's quite a stretch. If these odd ideas about philanthropy were simply out there in the world, they probably wouldn't have attracted quite so much criticism. But many are understandably baffled that a movement called effective altruism, ostensibly dedicated to steering philanthropy in a more useful and humanitarian direction, expends so much energy promoting and funding causes the average person doesn't find especially useful or humanitarian. Still, if the members of EA organizations believe strongly that those causes will benefit humankind the most, where's the problem? I think there's a key misunderstanding at the core of all that furor, a common confusion between two sets of related ideas that can result in some havoc if used interchangeably, which, unfortunately, they often are. In his book, The Utopia of Rules, historian and activist David Graeber asserts that the notion of rationality has been interpreted a few different ways over millennia. For the ancient Greeks, it was calculation and logic, sure, but it was also the divine faculty that allowed humans to override their baser instincts in pursuit of a transcendent good. Cardio might feel awful in the moment, everything in your body might tell you to stop, but reason tells you that you'll have a longer and healthier life if you exercise, so it's rational to do your cardio. Graeber argues that around the beginning of the Enlightenment, a different sense of rationality developed as more of an individual, instrumental thing a property of internal consistency between goals and actions contingent on the values of the person acting. If you wanted to live a longer, healthier life, then cardio would be rational. If you maybe wanted a shorter, unhealthy life with less running and more video games, maybe not. Graeber argues that people play fast and loose between these two definitions, switching back and forth between them without too much thought, and that this can cause a great deal of confusion and consternation. On the one hand, the small r instrumental rationality is such a low bar that it's hard to imagine anyone arguing with it. So long as your actions aren't making it harder to achieve your stated goals, so long as your behavior isn't obviously self-defeating or delusional, congrats, you're rational. Importantly, instrumentality requires a value-neutral stance toward the goals themselves. Someone who decided they wanted to end all life on Earth would have several instrumentally rational means of pursuing those ends. On the other hand, the ancient Greek capital R, rationality, has vibes of virtue baked into it, a notion of some ultimate good that humans are all trying their best to achieve, whether or not they're aware of it, succeeding or failing based on the strength of their capacity for reason. If you tell someone who's drunk dialing an ex to think this through and be rational, you don't need to check on what their goals are in that moment to see if those goals are aligned with their actions. There's a higher standard you're appealing to that they're obviously not satisfying. Mistaking one for the other can lead to a presumption of neutrality when someone's making a value judgment, or possibly frustration when you're trying to determine someone's values and they simply offer a set of coherent possibilities. You can see a similar mix-up in what we might mean when we describe charity as being effective. Nobody would argue that charity donations ought to be ineffective. If you feel passionately about doing something nice for kids with terminal diseases, we can all agree you can do better than the Kids Wish Foundation. But some effective altruists also have particular ideas about how philanthropic donations ought to be distributed for maximum impact. 
That is to say, they have a notion of some ultimate good that charity should maximize and urge others to donate effectively, that is, according to those values. It can be hard to notice where one type of effectiveness ends and the other begins, but once you're looking for it, a lot of the weirdness around EA vanishes. Asking how to do the most good with my money isn't an instrumental sort of question unless I first define what I consider to be good. If I don't, I'm just asking someone else how they would spend my money according to their values, which I may or may not agree with. I shouldn't be surprised if someone with different priorities has a different vision of what the future should look like. Which leads me back to the tax exemptions enjoyed by nonprofits and their donors in the U.S. The vast majority of U.S. taxpayers, myself included, don't claim charitable donations on our taxes because we don't meet the threshold of tax-deductible spending we need to qualify for special treatment. That's not true of the top 1% of earners. 9 out of 10 millionaires do manage to write off various expenditures, including what they spend on charity. As a consequence, most of those nonprofit tax breaks go to people who can afford to donate a lot of money. Now, I might find it wasteful or offensive that religious celebrities get to live in giant estates that, if they weren't tax-exempt, might help pay for hurricane relief or public transit or something. But most of the money that goes to religious organizations comes from lots of small donations, a few thousand dollars here and there that wouldn't warrant any sort of tax break. Churches don't have to give any portion of those funds to the IRS, but the donors themselves don't see any benefit. In contrast, there are numerous political and highly litigious 501c3 nonprofits funded almost entirely by large donations from wealthy benefactors. Donors who get to subtract that philanthropy from what they owe in tax money. Not only do these organizations get to operate tax-free, whether they're sponsoring Supreme Court justices, fighting tooth and nail against abortion access or trans rights, dismantling public education, or lobbying for economic policies that favor the wealthy, the rest of us get stuck with the hole in the budget left by the donations pledged to them. I am literally paying for their operation, and it's not hard to guess how their values might not align with my own. I have to admit, it is instrumentally rational for billionaires to fund institutions that benefit billionaires and their interests using what would otherwise be public money. But when I say it like that, it does sound kind of crazy. Is the structure of charitable donations and tax breaks in the U.S. unfair? Where else do you see the instrumental value-based mismatch causing confusion? What causes do you feel most passionate about? Please leave a comment below and let me know what you think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to pop off, subscribe, blah, share, and don't stop thunking.